Okay, hello together. We now start our, I'm not sure, fifth lecture on machine learning. Perhaps it's a sixth, but I think it's a fifth. And today we continue with neural networks. And um, again, as in the meetings, lectures before, please don't hesitate to ask us questions, to join in via microphone or simply type in. We will look at these questions and we are happy to interrupt our presentation here because um, we do not see exactly how well you understand this and your feedback is very welcome, especially in this screening. <clears throat> okay, I've, um, uh, the screen is shared. Do you see this, Martin? I cannot see whether the screen is shared. The screen is shared. Yeah, very good. Um, we are in neural networks and I will uh, today give a very short recap of the history, uh, how this came to this idea to build the learning machines inspired by neurons. And then uh, we'll also present the important anecdotes and what we learned from, from this history and the way out of problems which were encountered, which led to different variants of the gradient descent method. And finally, enabled the so called multi layer perceptron. <clears throat> the multi layer perceptron then gave rise to coupled networks, feedback net networks, convolutional networks, and the so called deep learning networks that we use nowadays. However, today I won't start with multi layer perceptron so that you have an idea. Today's lecture is about perceptron learning and gradient descent. This here is a very, very simple model of a neuron. Neuron here means a, a biological entity which is somehow in our brain, lots of them. We have a cell body here. This is this, this uh, dark area in the middle and we have so-called dendrites which collect incoming information and we have an axon which outputs information and the basic principle is that uh, such a cell body collects inputs from about 100,000 um, axons which, which, which reef, uh, reach this body and they can accumulate or transport information and very interesting is also the concept of the so-called synapses, which, which you see here, where axons can insert or initiate or start some kind of electrical pulse. And this is done in a chemical way. And having all this, you, you have, have to think this, this go, goes back here to, to our organs like an eye. Yes, or, or other things. And this information is collected here. And uh, I present this for the first reason to show it has somehow inspired the mathematical, mathematical models on artificial neural networks, the so-called ANNs. But most, more, much more importantly, um, uh, our ANNs that we use are very primitive simplifications and the biological model is far away from this. And I present this model here to say, no, our brain is completely different and much more complicated. However, this is often brought this example that I, I will also bring this here and it nicely connects to the history, but please take this information. The brain is much more complicated and especially for instance, the information which is transmitted here where, where chemicals are inserted and they, they are able to develop pulses which are frequency modulated, which are amplitude modulated, which bring so-called spikes, so-called um, pulse strains. This is very compli complicated uh, biochemical um, behavior. And this is somehow accumulated here and the word accumulation does also not capture what really happens here. This is really, really smart. Anyway, we take this model for the moment and a few facts um, which I have here. 
um, are quite interesting. In our brain, we have about 100 billion neurons. The length of a dendrite or an axon is about a thousandth millimeter. Yeah, this is uh, this is about uh, a thousandth millimeter. The dendrites of a neuron are connected. This shows a massive parallelism which we have in our brain to about 200,000 other neurons. And uh, the fan out of an axon, yes, it is, is 10,000. This is crazy. That means here the fan out is about to send 10,000, no, not 10 millions. Okay. Um, um, some of the information I have um, told is also listened here. Frequency modulation, if a particular stimulus is exceeded, stimulus is exceeded, we, we get an output. The direction is from, we can make it simple, from left to right. Yes, we go from here to here. This is, uh, this is something which we more or less copy, in fact, from the new biological model. Yeah, and this is perhaps the most interesting thing. Yeah, what we should also see, the switching of a neuron is, is not so high, yeah? about a thousand, thousand, uh, thousand second, which is pretty slow if you compare it to what is today's possible in, in an electrical circuit, in a modern microprocessor. It means in, in your well-trained reaction time of tenths of a second, about 100 activities can take place. That means if you do something very spontaneously, you cannot have done deep thoughts or something like this. Only 100 neural activities on a quick reaction. And the question is, and this is uh, not completely solved or it's, it's far from being solved, is how with, with this speed, uh, slow speed is, uh, is not the right word, with this low velocity, how can we get to such great decisions which we do in, in, very, in this very short time? This is an interesting thing and we are the, the, the neuroscientists and the uh, Physicists are thinking and working on this, and um, we are still impressed about how this works. And I want to point this out to say that we have great deep learning models at the moment, but with regard to energy consumption, speed, the space of it means the room which takes the brain, this is far from being reached. In. Anyway, we couldn't can be confident that in a 50, 100 or 1,000 years, we are much far developed, but at the moment, we are far behind this. Having this in mind, what we think or what people thought is in, is in our brain happening, um, I give a, a brief um, sketch of the history. 1943, the famous Warren McCullough and Walter Pitts presented a model of the neurons, something like I've shown you here before. And um, perhaps even more interesting because this is in fact used today was the work of Donald Hepp. Donald Hepp um, said we, we do not train the brain or a computer system or an artificial neural network as a whole monolithic entity. We train only those parts, those elements, those neurons which are involved in a decision. This is very smart. And he found this out that this happens in nature as well. And this, uh, this changed a lot in, in programming and thinking and developing these networks. He called this reinforcement for active neurons. And, and this is a very important point, this so-called heavy learning. 
1958, Frank Rosenberg develops a perceptron model. You, you will see this on the next slide. There it does not happen a lot. This is something like this, but I will come to this in a minute. And they prove what this model could compute. In quotes, I write compute because it was not a lot, but the people were impressed because and this computation arrived from looking at data. And this was for that time very, um, very modern, very spectacular. And uh, it was not pre sought Here's an algorithm that does it step by step. This was, and is today even the most important programming model. This was learned. And the question is, what can be learned? What can be computed if you look at data with a perceptron. And this um, led to the perceptron con convergence theory. And I present this history because the impact and uh, discussion of these results have great, great importance until today in 2D learning. And um, I want you to understand the steps that the people took and which are still today there in our ANN thinking. Yes, they were very proud. And in 1962, one was thinking as a scientist, we are close before modeling the human brain. And 1969, Marvin Minsky, if you haven't heard from him, you should write this in your mind. Marvin Minsky is the most famous AI researcher, um, which has been lived. He died a few years ago. And the Marvin Minsky and Seymour paper published a book on the limitations on the perceptron model. And this was um, a shocking book because they showed how primitive and how restricted this model actually is. And because Marvin Minsky paper is also known, but Marvin Minsky was his god of thinking that time until, let's say, in the late 90s. Um, they all researchers stopped research on artificial neural networks. Yes, this is true. The research paused, and this is really crazy. Here you see how research works. There, come, there, there comes a person, in this day, that day it was Minsky, he said, look how weak the model is, and thousands of researchers stopped working on this. And only by 1985, the things changed. They changed because the so-called delta rule, which is a derivative of the sigmoid function, which you already know from, a, from another connection, was um, shown uh, to overcome the limitations that Marvin Minsky and Seymour paper presented. And uh, this led to the development of the multi-layer perceptron, which is the standard, uh, with, with feedback loop, uh, is a standard model which we use nowadays. And um, I presented you this, this research because I think this is very important to know, also to, to uh, be more humble than certain researchers and also to see what is possible and also maybe to try to learn from the nature even more. Okay, let's continue to the mathematics of this. And interestingly, Many things which we you will see now will remind you to things which you have seen with uh, linear models, logistic models, and so on. But their development and the presentation and the um, discovery was completely different. And there are also subtle but very effective differences to that what we have seen. And one of the most important differences is hinted here in this, in this um, drawing, namely the so-called heavy side function. The heavy side function, I will come to this also later, is a step function, which looks like this. And um, very primitive function, everything which is uh, on the left-hand side on the input space is uh, gets a zero, right of this gets a one. Uh, the point is that this is a non-linear non function and then that it cannot be easily trained. And uh, this non-linearity is the reason for the limitations, but also 
the possibilities if it is overcome of this model. Because I want you to understand this. Okay, and we have inputs as before to make it similar to our mathematical framework, which you have seen by now in p dimensions. Yeah, this is a p dimensional feature vector. Perhaps you recall a few lessons ago, there was a enjoy sports things. And um, this is can be compared to this. We have feature vectors here as input. The feature vectors are weighted. These weights are accumulated. And if a certain threshold is um, overcome or reached, an output is generated. And um, this is a uh, Similarity with this here. You see, things are collected, accumulated, and a certain chemical threshold is reached here, and output is generated. We will use this simple model to solve a problem, namely, again, the binary classification problem. The feature space is again an inner product space. It means we have a field, we can uh, compute the scalar product. We have two classes. We are looking for a function that takes an input and says yes or no, spam or not spam, good or not good, and so on. And again, we have a set of examples. It means it, nothing changed so really. And that it appears so similar to the previous problems is also kind of our deductive presentation. We want to make these problems in their setting very similar to each other so that you can easily compare what is in fact the difference. And the setting in fact did not change. Our task is now to compute this function, this classifier, not with regression like we did before, not with uh, uh, find S or another concept learning algorithm, but with a perceptron. The perceptron at the moment is um, a bit linked here, is this. The computation in the perceptron was already hinted. We um, accumulate weights, and if the weights are above a certain threshold, we give a one, if they are below, we give a zero. I've connected this to, um, sorry, to linear models that you see this, it looks very much like this. Yeah, and you see, if we are here, We do zero, if we're here, we do a one. We have now described this in a, on a coordinate system that we have written here, the accumulated weights, and here is our threshold. And we often, like we did before, write the scalar product notation for this sum. A hypothesis is a vector with p plus one components, like before. For simplification purposes of notation, we also add uh, an additional dimension with a fixed weight and a certain input. And the decision rule, which looked before this way, did not change a lot. It is only moved onto the orbit. Ordinate axis here. And now we have 
exactly the form which we had before in linear regression. By the way, the function heavy side, don't write it with a y, it's heavy. No, it has nothing to do with heavy. It is from a quite famous mathematician about 100 years before our time, Oliver Heavy side. Also be careful with the dimensionality of the weight vector. If we use it as a directional vector, we do not consider the zero component. What you now see here is the algorithm that was presented by um, Mikolov and Fitz. And this is the so-called Decepton algorithm. And I have presented the other algorithms, for instance, the LMS algorithm directly in parallel to show you how similar they are. We have, this is the LMS algorithm, the repetition loop. We select examples. We compute some, it was not called output, a Y value. We compute some divergence or difference of what we expect. And we compute an update here. And the neural network, we do pretty much the same. We select an example. Uh, we here is the first difference. We use, we apply the heavy side function on the scalar product. And it means the result here of this, of this uh, y term is zero or one. And um, that means also that um, if we subtract this from our class, the correct class, we get deltas which are either zero, one, or minus one. Only these three values are possible. And taking one of these uh, outcomes here, depending on the computation, we start as before with a random weight. That means we directly can compute something. Uh, we get here some delta. We update our, our feature vector. We do not update in a, this in a smart way, like we sorry did this year, we, where we computed the residuals, no, this is very primitive in the new one. We add one or minus one without knowing everything from the global environment. This means this is a local operation and that although this algorithm looks so similar to this, it is completely different. This algorithm here has no gradient information, looks only at one example, that's only a simple correction. This is the most primitive algorithm to draw a separating line. And hence you understand my questions from the beginning. Where we ask ourselves what can be computed at all this distance. Okay, before we think about this, I give a demonstration how this algorithm operates. And it is also nice to understand this because the combination of the perceptron algorithm, the linear regression model, and the risk consideration of Wapnik led to the so-called support vector machines, which we will learn in the next lesson. We start by looking on a two-dimensional plane. In this plane, you see a green line. And we think this is a line. OK, it could be a higher dimension a hyperplane. It's called, to be mathematically precise, an affine hyperplane. That means, uh, I uh, say it a bit simplified. It can be moved um, across, uh, aside from the um, origin. And you can define a plane or a hyperplane with the so-called Hessian normal form. You see this here, you, you define this here. You see this um, in the Wikipedia 
figure there's also a plane and you see a normal vector exactly the way you see it on our slide. And this normal vector um, pretty much specifies the direction of this line. Namely, in that sense, if we uh, do the scalar product of this normal vector and uh, some x, then we get, if the x is here, this scalar product gives us a distance. Or formulated another way, all points that are on this line here have the scalar product directional normal vector times x is zero. This is a recap from standard mathematics and I bring it for this reason. Um, we should also um, see that this normal um, vector um, has a certain length. Yeah? We can compute its norm. And this is interesting um, from uh, various viewpoints. It has to do with regularization. You learned this already. And we will consider this again um, when we go to support vector machines. It means that although the length of this vector I also show you this direct because uh, this will might answer the questions that you get later on. The length uh, does not change the direction, of course not. It influences the learning process. It makes it more unstable. The longer this, this, this length is, the, the more problematic is the learning process. And this gave rise to regularization, which we learned, which you learned uh, one lesson before. Uh, consider the following observation now that gave rise to this learning machine. If for two points, x1 and x2, we see that the uh, signal when computing the scalar product minus d, d is the distance offset of this line from the <coughs> origin, if this is the same, then x1 and x2 lie on the same side of the hyperplane. And it means if an x1 is here and an x2 is there, their sign is different. And if we have an x3 here, um, their sign is the same. And then with, with this computation, you can find out are they on the same side. And if you now change the normal vector, you, you turn this. Um, this plane. If you change the directional part, you turn this plane, and if you change the offset part, you, know, you move it more away from the origin. And um, what the algorithm now does, it somehow manipulates this, um, this uh, vector depending on the examples it gets presented. And this manipulation, this change, does exactly the thing we want, although it's so primitive. Here's a bit of background. I will skip over this, but uh, one, there's one point which I, I want to say. Oh, No, no, this is, there's nothing uh, I haven't told by now. This is, this is okay. Yeah, there's one hint to heavy and learning. Yeah, the heavy and learning, which I said to you before, uh, comes into play in the line six and seven of the algorithm. Namely, in that sense that only the J dimension is manipulated. You cannot see it here because this is a vector form here, but we will see this later when we derive 
the gradient descent. <clears throat> I take a simple example to demonstrate how this works. Your task is to separate two sets of letters. It is very primitive. Consider it as a model task for OCR, optical character recognition, because of its principle exactly they work like this. We have these handwritten letters. These letters are presented to the perceptron. We know for each letter to which class it belongs. You see it is supervised somehow. And to make this uh, manageable for a computer, we compute features from these letters, for instance, the number of crossing or the height or the, the level of darkness, which this um, blue here introduces. You can invent whatever, invent whatever you want. Yeah? And then we have these two classes um, here. On the left-hand side, we have the vector which we assign because we know these letters to class one and on the right-hand side, we have class one. And for illustration purposes, we look only in a two-dimensional feature space. We say we have only two features, number of crossings and level of darkness, something like this. And um, since these features were so fantastic, let's say this way, you see um, these objects are well separated. And if we, if we look on this, the algorithm cannot look on this like this, but we can look on this and present these examples in a two dimensional space. We see two well separated groups. And we directly see, wow, we can see to which class an example belongs. However, the algorithm has not this God's eye view but can only take one example. And it starts, and I will sometimes jump to the algorithm, it starts by arbitrarily uh, initializing these weights. And this means it throws in a line. And this line is not useful. It does not separate these two classes. And the algorithm then takes one example. Yes, it chooses one example and analyzes these examples. In, in that it, um, it has this, for this example, the feature vector, it has this currently chosen random directional vector. You see here without the W0, it's a directional vector. And it computes the scalar product. That means we are now We have selected this, the random select was here, and now we compute this scalar product and then take the heavy side. And if we do this and update the weight vector, exactly this happens. Yeah, you will, you will see this. If you take an example, do this scalar product computation, do the heavy side function, add this one or zero to the weight vector, this happens. And if you continue with this, this happens. If you select an example from one or either side. This happens for this reason, because if you choose the example from, from the left side, then this is classified correctly. And this term here becomes zero and nothing happens. So this, this, sorry, this delta becomes zero and nothing happens. And if you take it from the other side, something happens. It means only as long as you pick by random, yeah, you can pick by random and uh, an example which is on one side, this happens with this primitive algorithm. And if you reached at one point in time this situation, you cannot pick a wrong example and this line does not move anymore. And of course, since you are a computer scientist, you should ask yourself, does this always work? This algorithm is so primitive these sets can be arbitrary 
We start arbitrary, we run in a select example, we do only an update of uh, in a certain component according to heavy and learning, and we do an update in a rough manner with one or minus one, does this work? Compare this again to this smart situation, which is uh, already known since uh, in early times in mathematics, where we do uh, as a regression of square distances. This is a global view on the algorithm, and this is clear that this works, but that the other thing works is not clear. I want to explain why the people are thinking about such primitive models before I continue. You say, if, if, if I compare this always with a fantastic global view of analysis, and I, I can explain you why they do this. We know, by biologists know, that we have not a global analysis engine in our head. It means our brain has to solve this regression problems in a very different way than mathematicians do. And Globe and McCulloch and Pitts were thinking about how this could be if you consider the situation here. Here's your eye, there comes a signal, the signal does something. How can this result into such a complex, great um, algorithm or behavior of the, that you can distinguish cats from dogs and so on. And see this primitive mechanism as, a, as, a, as an attempt to understand how the brain works. And these questions, of course, were asked. Which kind of learning task can be addressed as a function of in the hypothesis space? And um, can this algorithm, which I have shown you here, construct such a function for a given task? And there is um, a theorem which answers this, and the theorem can be proven. And we don't bring this proof in this uh, course. I will give it to you with the slides, but it will not be part of the examination to answer already this question. But we want you to know this, and we want you that it's not a hidden secret. You can read this there. However, for the moment, take a minute and read this. I will switch off my mic in the meantime. Perceptron convergence theory. Here I've underlined a key aspect of this. Let W hat define a separating hyperplane. This means to be mathematically strict, there is such a hyperplane. It means we are able to draw such a line. That means our problem is so simple, there's no noise, that there is space for a line which perfectly separates two classes. If we have such a situation, and if the examples that we are giving are processed as a perceptron, algorithm, the constructed weight vector W will converge within a finite number of iterations. This can be proven. The key, or one of the keys of this line of, uh, to, of this proof, is that there's a lower bound of the smallest change 
when this line moves. And in the proof, this is somehow, of course, not directly epsilon, but computed to some kind of epsilon. And this does not vanish with the number of iterations, does not go to zero, but has a finite size, a finite lower bound. This insight together with the so called Cauchy Schwarz inequality sorry, that's wrong direction makes this line of argument. And then a, a few uh, slides follow where this is more formulated, but these are the two key aspects. There's a finite lower bound for a movement. You can directly derive this from the size of the weight vector. And there is a Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. This inequality relates the norm of here in this case, this will be the uh, W vector, the weight vector, and some x, and the scalar product. And with these two things, it's not witchcraft to prove this conversions can happen. However, only if these two sets are linearly separable. I skip the proof. If you're interested in that, please read this. And if you have questions with regard to the proof, we are open to help you. However, I directly go ahead now and you recall I mentioned the situation that the preliminaries of the theorem ask for linear separability. This is what you see on the left hand side. This is not our real world. Our real world looks like this. You see so-called label noise. Yeah? Yeah, this, this B is on the wrong side, this A is on the wrong side. And to directly give an answer, the PT algorithm has no chance to, 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 to work with this. And the, the PT algorithm wants to have a clear decision. You are on the right side, you are on the left side, and this is okay. Smarter is the consideration, and this leads to gradient descent, to look at the distances which we have here. And now you might quickly understand that this could do some has to do something with regression. If we look at the distances, we could say instead of asking for all points being on the correct side and producing no error, we can say we collect the number of distances which are wrong. This would be here a distance, sorry, this is too small, and here a distance. And we move the line at that position and that this number of distances of wrong points are, is minimum. And this is exactly what we did implicitly when we were working here. We moved this point in such a way that the distances of misclassified points, the residuals, the squared residuals, it depends on the loss function, is minimum. And the way how we find this minimum is called gradient descent. And hence we mentioned this term already. This is a BGD algorithm which we presented with logistic regression. And uh, what you see here this here is gradient descent. 
We present it through this algorithm and we presented you the LMS algorithm without saying this. We said, ah, oh, look, we compute the difference and then we use this. But this difference, this is computed from looking at the loss curve or the error curve, computing the derivative and trying to minimize this. And this is a missing building block which we present now. Yes, we have already used the algorithm. You have already used the algorithms. But why do they work? The explanation comes now. Interestingly, I could show you why the PT algorithm already worked. I presented you this algorithm today and its proof. Okay, I skipped the proof, but I presented you a problem, an algorithm, and showed that it can deal with this. With the LMS and the BGD algorithm, I presented you a problem, an algorithm, but did not explain why it worked. This is now solved. Multi, this, yeah, comes here, yeah, sorry, we are here, gradient descent. Um, back to the situation. Um, we want to assess somehow the error that we do if we put a line into a set of examples. We will measure this error, or better I should say loss, because it is not an error, it is a penalty which we say, to which we also say loss. And we will compare the different losses depending on different hyperplanes. This hyperplane has a loss, this hyperplane has a loss, this hyperplane has a loss. And we will compare all possible hyperplanes in, in within one setting. And this is possible, and you will see it in a moment, because this setting is a so-called convex, convex optimization setting. 